welcome to church. Come on, stand up. Hey, today's going to be a good day. Let's worship Jesus right from the start today. Oh, he's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. So let's give it to him. Boy, you call me friend. Yeah. And I call you Savior. The light of the world. Faithful forever. You say I'm loved. Hey. And fully forgiven. Say lay down your past and walk in my freedom. Yeah. I'm alive in you. I'm alive in you. Yeah. I'm alive because you're alive in me. Yes, you are, God. And even though you see all that I've done After every single time I've run Somehow your love, it never changes Somehow your grace, it keeps on chasing Here I am, fully loved by you yeah. Alright, come on you say I'm no, hey. no, I'm not forgotten. Oh, you say I'm yours. Yeah, I've been adopted. Yes, I have. Oh, you say I'm yours. Yeah, I've been adopted. I've run Somehow your love It never changes Somehow your grace It keeps on chasing Even when I doubt That you are good And I don't want to trust you When I should Somehow you're faithful To the faithless Somehow your grace it keeps on chasing, so here I am, fully loved by you, fully loved, fully loved by you. Line to sight, from grave to sky, I've been raised from death to light. I'm no longer bound, my chains are on the ground. I've been made alive in Christ, and I was dead in sin till your love came in. I've been raised from death to life. Now I belong with you and your family too I've been made alive in Christ Come on, this is our story, let's sing it to him From blind to sight, from grave to sky I've been raised from death to life And I'm no longer bound, my chains are on the ground I've been made alive in Christ. I was dead in sin till your love came in. I've been raised from death, from death to life. Now I belong with you and your family too. I've been made alive in Christ. And even though you've seen all that I've done, after every single 
time I front Somehow your love, it never changes Somehow your grace, it keeps on chasing Even when I doubt that you are good And I don't want to trust you when I should Somehow you're faithful to the faithless Somehow your grace, it keeps on chasing So here I am, fully loved by you Fully loved, fully loved, yeah Amen, yeah Well, that's our position with Jesus this morning. Fully loved, fully forgiven, adopted. So let's praise him for who he is and what he's done. Respond to his goodness. Oh, he loves to hear your voice today. So let him hear it. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. All right, come on, lift it up. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lifts him high. With all creation cry. Faith be the song that calls the storm inside of me. Let it rise, let it rise, yeah. Let faith arise, let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him on with all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, sing it. We praise you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. Come on, sing it. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven.
Hey, during this next song, we're going to celebrate a baptism together. So as a church family, when they come up out of the water, let's celebrate as they come into the family of God. Yeah. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs. I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my praise you again and again all that i have is hallelujah, hallelujah. and i know it's not much i have nothing else before you except for a heart singing
can we give him praise today? Come on, is he worthy today? Yeah. Hey man, he's worthy. How good was that baptism? It's so good. Oh, praise Jesus. Psalm 63. You, God, are my God, and earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. But I've seen you in the sanctuary, and I've beheld your power and your glory. And because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. And I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Guys, when we're singing to Jesus, there's something that happens in our soul. It says, God, I am fully satisfied in you. That even if we're in a, in a dry and parched land, and even if we're walking through crazy stuff in life right now, or even in this moment right now, we can come to Jesus. And when we set our attention on him, set our perspective on him, put our eyes on him, something inside of us shifts and, and, and our soul says, I'm satisfied. I'm fully satisfied. And don't you love that he hears us when we sing to him? Don't you, lo don't you love that he is actually here with us even in this moment? Isn't it so good, the God that we're singing to today? And I feel like, man, we just need to be reminded of how good he is, be reminded of the gospel that you and I are just like so unbelievably flawed, so unbelievably sinful, but at the exact same time, through Jesus in Christ, we are more loved and more forgiven and more accepted than we could ever dream of being. This is the truth of the gospel, and this is where we stand today. This is our position with him, fully loved, adopted, forgiven, and all of these things. Isn't that good? Yeah, thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of our praise. You guys can have a seat. And let's take communion together in light of all of these things. Because this is what it took Jesus to, to make this our reality. That we could have access to him, that we could be close to him. It's because he went to the cross and he died for our sins and paid a price that we could never pay. Paid a debt that we could never pay. And he died and he rose again. And so as we take communion today, let's remember his body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed on the cross that has washed our past white as snow, our future white as snow. And just be reminded today that he's good. Be reminded today that he's a provider. Be reminded today that you're not too far gone. Be reminded that he's close. So why don't you just take a few moments with him, take communion, and just say, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I love that your word says, for when we were a long way off, for while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's so good, God. Thank you for being the way that you are. Endless forgiveness, endless love. We're just overcome by how good you are. So Jesus, today we just ask that you would move in our hearts in a new way, that you would open us up, because God, we want to leave this place changed today. We want to leave this place looking way more like you today. And Jesus, we say that you're worthy of our praise in all seasons and all circumstances. God, you are worthy because your love is better than life.
Your love is better than life. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. We pray all of these things in your name. And the church said, all together, amen. 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 Hey, so good to be uh, with everybody this morning. And uh, we're going to be continuing on on our series, Jesus Manifesto, today as we continue to work through the Beatitudes, um, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, today we're going to be talking about this idea of peace. And it's so timely for us, especially in the culture in which we live, uh, because at least in my lifetime, this might, we, we might be in the midst of the most divided times ever, especially in the context of our culture. It just seems like we, we live in a culture that's really good at, at creating lines and drawing lines and dividing people up, and we spend a lot of time figuring out, you know, what groups uh, do we align with, and, and then we talk about the people on the other side. So it's, it's very easy to do. For example, I'll do, I'll do it right now. Um, if I had to sum up the world, if you're like, hey, put, put people in, in groups in, in the whole world. Here's how I do it. There, there are two kinds of people in the world. Here's what I think. There are people who like to eat hard-boiled eggs, and then there are followers of Jesus. That's it. That's the two. All right. I'm just kidding. There are two groups of people. People who like to eat hard-boiled eggs and then people who have come to the right conclusion and no, that's not the way to eat an egg. But I'm just curious. Fred Campus participate. How many of you in the room enjoy hard-boiled eggs? Go ahead. Just raise your hand real quick. Oh, wow. I mean, that's like 90% of the room. Okay. So um, I'm in the minority here. That's fine. I... I don't get it, all right? I don't get it, and I want you to, I, like, I just want you to see my perspective just for a second, and I kind of know why I don't like it, but uh, uh, I, there's just something about it, I don't get it, but when you, like, when you take that hard-boiled egg out, and then you, you know, you crack, you get, you get, you know, crack it, and you get all the stuff off, the shell off, and then I'm just telling you, when you take that first bite, okay, there is just something about that first bite that, for me, I just start gagging in my mouth. I don't even know why. I just can't handle it. And you know, listen, the hard-boiled egg is, is the gateway to the devil's egg, all right? So you be careful with that. That thing's even worse, all right? So there's just something about it. Now, also from my perspective, this might have something to do with it, but when I was growing up, my mom used to cook this meal, um, and it was called ham loaf. Very similar to meat loaf, but it, it involved ham. And, and her ham loaf it reeked. It smelled so bad. In fact, it would stink up our house. I, I could not be in the house because it smelled so bad. And so what would happen was, is I would just avoid. I'd be outside all day. And for whatever reason for me, a hard-boiled egg, especially when you're, you're preparing it, it smells almost exactly like my mom's ham loaf. And she's watching this morning. Mom, love you. I, I, and it just, I, it just, it's a smell for me that I can't get past. And even right there, I mean, I, it just in 60 seconds, I divided this room. There's about almost like 90% of you that love hard-boiled eggs. There's 10% of us that don't. I mean, just about any topic in life, any belief system, any value, any opinion, it's really easy to create lines. And then when you, a line is created, you, you naturally choose. You, you find which side of the line that, that you like to, to be on. Are you on this side or this side? And you're going to choose a side that fits, again, your belief system. And then here's what happens. You, you jump to your side and you naturally then begin getting information that backs up your side. You start reading and, and finding, you know, articles and things and information and statistics that back up the side that you're on. And then you start finding people that believe what you believe and you start hanging out with, with those people. And because of the culture in which we live, then all, we just live in such a hostile time that when somebody's on the other side of your line, it can get a little crazy. And, and we have so many polarizing topics. We have so many lines that have been, you know, drawn in, in the context of our culture. And here's just a couple, but, you know, just, just big arching groups of people. I mean, you've got Republicans and you've got Democrats, you've, you've got religious people, then you have secular You've got the white community and the black community. You've got, you know, remember this one, mask or no mask, right? Huge lines. Gay or straight. Pro-choice or pro-life. I mean, these are big discussions. And lines have been drawn. And when lines are drawn, you choose a side. And a lot of times when you're looking over at the person on the other side of, of your belief, we we kind of have this default, again, in our culture that goes something like this. If you don't agree with me, 
It's kind of like, you know, forget you. If you're not with me, then you're clearly against me. And oftentimes when we look at the people on the other side, we are quick to say that the reason why they believe what they believe is because they've got the wrong facts and they're just not as competent. They're not just, you know, they're not as smart as we are because if they could see it or if they could understand or if they had the right information, then they would come to the right conclusion, which only breeds conflict. And in our culture, we, this is just something we've got to own. We, we don't quite understand what it means to disagree with a person who thinks differently than us. I mean, I'm just convinced we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to act. We don't know what to say. We, we don't even know what to do. I mean, this has to be one of the most pressing conversations that's facing our society. How? How in the world do you have civil conversations in a polarized culture where the lines have been drawn? How do you do it? In fact, I, I think if you're, if you're a parent in a room, this is, this is one of the biggest conversations in the context of, of leading your kids. Kids, how do we do this? How, how do we engage with people who are different than us, who have different opinions and values? How do you engage with people who don't like you? If you were like brand new to the planet this morning, if you just showed up today as an adult and you just started watching you know, television and the news and just going out in the context of our communities, you would quickly realize that, that we have kind of grouped this thing up. You would come to a conclusion, wow, this group here doesn't really like this group, and I'm just watching what they say and what they do, or man, that group over there, I don't even quite get it, but for whatever reason, I don't know what the story is, but that group over there does not like this group over there. You can tell by their body language. You can tell how they stare. You can tell by what they post. It's, I don't get it. I'm new here, but they just don't like each other. This is the world in, in which we live. So here's the thing this morning. I'm going to read a couple of things, and if any of these hold true to you, then I'm, this message is for you, and odds are there's something here. There is something here for you to lean into. But in your life, if there, if there are people who you won't talk to or you won't have a meal with, this is for you today. If you've been having the same fight with your spouse for years, this is for you. If you're constantly at odds, with the people you work with, this is for you. If you get upset with or avoid people who hold different views than you, this, this is for you. If you've ever drawn a line and used phrases like those people or my people, and as Christians, we tend to do that quite a bit, then this message is for you. Here's what Jesus would say. If any of those things are true, in the context of following Jesus, Jesus would say to you this morning, you are missing out. And especially if you're a Christian, if any of those things are true of you, then you also might be keeping other people out. So this morning, we're, we're back in Matthew chapter 5. We're working through the Beatitudes. This is you know, one of the most famous sermons that Jesus a ever gave. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts out with these statements. These kind of, these big statements about what it looks like to to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. And they, they're tough, they're difficult, they're very, very challenging. And today we're gonna to be talking about this idea of peace. So here's what Jesus says. This is Matthew chapter five, verse nine. Jesus says this, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are in your place in God's family. NIV version would say like this, if you grew up in church, this would sound more familiar, but blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Not a lot of shock value in the room when I just read that, but 2,000 years ago when Jesus is beginning his sermon and he's walking through the Beatitudes, he's going through each one, there's, there is some tension in what he's saying, but I'm telling you when he gets to this one, there is extreme tension. There's incredible shock value. When he's talking about being a peacemaker or talking about the idea of cooperating instead of competing or fighting, you've got to remember who he's talking to. Israel was in no way living in peace. And they weren't working for it. They surely weren't interested in it because Rome was the enemy. Israel was looking for another David to take down their Goliath. I mean, they weren't looking for a peacemaker. They were looking for a fighter. 
And so when Jesus is working through kind of his foundational statements about who he is and what his kingdom looks like, and he goes, guys, in my kingdom, you know who's blessed? The ones who bring peace. Might have been one of the hardest teachings that he would give. And I'll be honest, that when I think about being you know, a peacemaker, I, I've got to say that this is something that doesn't come easy to me. I, I'm an Enneagram 8. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a challenger, which means I often have strong opinions. And, and my idea of a good time is a, is a spirited debate. I, I don't necessarily cause conflict, but I don't have any trouble jumping in. It can energize me sometime, and this has gotten me into some trouble over the years. In fact, when my wife Vanessa and I, when we got married and, and, and we started dealing with conflict in the context of our marriage, me being an aide, I, I wanted to get after it. I wanted to have the argument, and, and sometimes I even kind of felt like, you know, the louder the better, but my wife, she's an Enneagram Six. She hates conflict. She avoids conflict almost at all costs. And so early on in our marriage, you know, I knew something was wrong, and I'd say to her, what's wrong? And guess what she would say? Nothing. And I'd say, yeah, but just tell me what's wrong. She goes, nothing wrong. Just tell me what's wrong. And we would do this dance for hours and hours and hours. And I remember this one time, this is early on, we had just been married a couple of months, and, and I'm leaning in, and I'm going, I know something's wrong, just say it. I know something's wrong, just say it. And I'm leaning in, I'm leaning in, I'm ready to have a good fight, and she just exploded. I mean, she went nuts, and she's yelling, and she's, you know, uh, you know getting out. And it, it took me back by surprise, because that's the first time I'd ever seen her do that. And I mean, she's putting her heart and soul into it, and she's giving me the business, and she gets done. I'll never forget it. And I just started clapping. I just started clapping. I was like, heck yeah, girl, that's what I'm talking about. That's how we need to do this, which just made her even more mad, and so that led us to counseling, okay? And so it, that's just me, and I know that about me. I, and for some of us, we, we've just got to own the fact that, that, that there's a, a portion of our community that, that doesn't want to deal with conflict, and then there's a portion that doesn't mind it and wants to lean in. And, and I've had to learn in, in, in my marriage, in, in my parenting, in the workplace, like many other Enneagram 8s, I've had to learn how to use my confrontational nature in a healthy way, not in a negative way. Because only used in an unhealthy way, you lose friends. <laughs> People don't want to be around you. And so when, when Jesus is leaning in here and he's going, look, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are people that, that see the opportunity not to increase conflict, but potentially resolve it. And if you're a Christian this morning, you gotta lean in because as Christians, I mean, one of our biggest claims as, as the church is that we love all people. We love all people. And we show people who Jesus is by how we love them. This is the foundational teaching of of Jesus, John 13 and John 15, Jesus is with his disciples and he says, I'll know you're my disciple by how you love one another. He's saying, listen, your love will lead the way. That's how I'll know. If you love me, I'll know you love me by how you love other people. And so the question this morning would be, well, what does that look like then with the people that are on the other side of the line? People that are on the other side of your belief system. People who don't think like you or look like you or act like you or vote like you. What does that look like in the context of our culture? Jesus leans in even more. Jump down to verse 43 in Matthew 5. He knew this would be a discussion. He knew there would be questions. So here's what he says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 2,000 years ago, loving your neighbor would not have been very difficult because probably more so than even now, people were kind of grouped together in their communities who were like-minded, same demographic, same social and economic status. I mean, your neighbor was almost just like you, which meant loving your neighbor wouldn't be that hard. And so when Jesus goes, you've heard the saying, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, well, they would go, well, yeah, that's really easy because I have just about everything in common with my neighbor. It's always easy to love people who love you back. Jesus keeps going, verse 46, leans in, creates some tension. 
Well, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Jesus goes, that's not very hard. Nobody's getting excited about that. Are not even the tax collectors doing that? I always, I always think it's funny because the guy who's kind of writing this for us, this story here, his name is Matthew. I'm named after him. Matthew was a tax collector before he was a follower of Jesus. And Jesus is making a point through tax collectors, those people. So Jesus goes, look, you know like the people that nobody likes? They're all like, yeah. And he goes, well, even those people love people who love them. It's not like a profound thing. I mean, we all do this. Verse 47, and if you greet only your people, you know, the people on your side of the line, what are you doing more than others? Everyone does that. Do not even pagans do that? So be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus is building this tension. He goes, look, you know there's lines drawn and there's those people and your people, but here's what you know. Everybody, you don't have to be a Christian to know this to be true. You naturally love the people that are on your side of the line. And Jesus is leaning in and going, what, what good is that? Even the worst of the worst. You know, those people, the tax collectors, they do that. You know, the pagans, you know, the people that worship false gods, they do that. Everybody does that. It's easy to love people on your side of the line. And then the discussion keeps going. You know, somewhere along the way, someone goes, well, what if, what if they hurt you? What if somebody takes a swing at you? What if somebody says something nasty? about you. Jesus, then, then what do you do? Jesus goes, ah, good question. Verse 38, you've heard that it, was, that it was said eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. You know, it used to be like, you know, somebody gets after you, you give it back to them. Verse 39, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So Jesus leans in, he goes, guys, there was an old way of doing this. How's that going for you? How's that going for you? It doesn't seem to be going that well. You've got this new way. If somebody hits you, you don't hit them back. If somebody strikes you, you just stand there and you take it. If somebody drags you into court and sues, you know, for the shirt off your back, you should take off the shirt and you should wrap it up and give it to the person as a gift. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, that's just an opportunity if you're a follower of Jesus to use the occasion to serve that person. I mean, just think about what Jesus is saying here. Totally go against the grain of our culture. It was totally going against the grain of the culture 2,000 years ago. Guys, this is gonna be different. Jesus is leaning in and he's saying, I want you to be passive with your retaliation, but I want you to be active with your love. The best retaliation is no longer revenge. It's love. Because followers of Jesus are peacemakers, not revenge seekers. This is a major theme of the New Testament. This isn't just a one kind of you know, sermon here in Matthew chapter five, many other New Testament writers pick up on this idea. Paul, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, he says it like this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, here's what you should do. Live at peace with everyone. Paul goes, look, this is really hard, but stop looking around at other people and criticizing what they're doing and not, or not doing. Just focus on you. What can you do? What can you do to bring peace, to be in peace, not just with your people, but all people? It goes like this in the message. Don't hit back. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, give him a drink. Your generosity, your generosity will surprise them with goodness. So don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. So it's very clear how you respond to people who disagree with you or people who hurt you or hate you or who say, who say mean things against you. How you respond to those people matters to God. It matters. How you respond not just to your people, 
but even the people on the other side. And Paul leans in and he says, you know what you should do? You should hit them back with love. You should be generous with your love. If you see a need, you should meet it, especially if it's an enemy, because enemies don't know what to do with love. They're not expecting it. They're expecting to you respond just like any other enemy would. Most enemies, they don't know what to do with love. And as we're talking about love and responding with love, you know, somebody just thought, well, there you go, Matt, that's what I'm talking about, because here's, here's what I say. I always say the most loving thing that we can do is tell those people the truth in love. I've heard that so many times. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm really good at? I'm thinking, you're not. But that's what they say. Matt, I'm so good. I mean, God put me here. I've got the gift of telling people the truth in love. That's what I do. And I know they're not good at it because that's something that I would have said years ago. You know, and there's this balance of truth and grace. And people that talk about how they're really good at delivering truth and love, they really, they really do that well. But that's what I do. I tell, you know, the truth in love. And I'm just telling you, in the context of the culture in which we live, it's a bad approach. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying it's bad. It's a bad approach. Because when, you, when you're telling somebody the truth in love, most likely in the context of that approach, here's what the other person is, is hearing. What they're hearing you say is, I wanna show you how wrong you are and how right I am. Let me tell you the truth in love. I'm right, you're wrong. That's what they hear. Man, I can't wait, I'm, I'm, I'm Christian and I'm gonna tell people the truth in love. And all the, listen, the only thing people are hearing you say is, they're wrong and you're right. And when you have that approach, people get defensive and they stop listening. I mean, I've had, I've had these conversations with Christians and they go, well Matt, listen, I gotta be true to myself. I gotta be true to myself, great. I hope you are. I'm not telling you to change your beliefs. I'm saying to potentially change your approach. This is what Jesus was doing 2,000 years ago. He's leaning in and going, guys, in my kingdom, it looks different. Our approach will be different. You know it's really easy to love people that love you. Yeah, okay, our approach with people who don't love you will be different than how the world works. You know how your enemies treat you? Yeah, you don't treat your enemies like that. You're gonna be generous with your love. If you're gonna be a peacemaker, then you're gonna to have to learn how to listen to understand how somebody else could see it differently than you. I mean, I would just argue, if you're gonna be a peacemaker, you've gotta to come to at least the conclusion that there's six plus billion people in this world and we don't all see it the same way. It always amazes me, you know, when, when church people are like, I can't believe so-and-so's on the other side of the line. And I go, really? We can't even agree about hard-boiled eggs. That's an easy one. Really? I mean, take any of those hot topics. Clearly, there's going to be people who see it differently than you. And you would be better. You would be more effective in the kingdom of God if you would come to the conclusion and expect that other people aren't going to see it the same way. And you know why? because we're all different. We grew up in different places, we had different parents, we have different brothers and sisters, we, some of us went to church, some of us didn't, some of us has, has experienced incredible tragedy in this life. I mean, there's so many things that go into kind of creating eventually a place where we go, I have a belief. Our stories are all different. Nobody's you know, lived the exact same life. And if you're gonna be a peacemaker, then you've gotta, become really good at wanting to hear the story about how somebody else arrived at their perspective. Here's what peacemakers do really well. Peacemakers, in the context of tension, can hold both perspectives up at the same time and still care about people who have a different perspective than them. The Apostle Paul did this in one of the first like, conflicts in the early church. You can go read about this in the scriptures. Uh, but one of the first arguments in the local church was about food. The Jewish Christians were, were coming into the church and, and the church was starting to reach Gentile Christians, people that were coming from pagan religions or just no religion at all. And so now you've got you know, these group of people that are coming into the church that are very different from one another and they're having an argument about what's happening down at the supermarket. 
Because down at the supermarket, there's, there's some meat. And this meat has been priced half off. And the reason why it's half off is because the Jewish Christians won't eat it. Because in their Jewish background, you were not allowed to eat meat that came from idol worship, which is where that meat has coming from. You've got these Gentile Christians who know nothing about that, and they like to save some money. And so they go into the supermarket and they're buying it. And all of a sudden you have this huge conflict within the church. Both sides are pointing at each other going, you can't do that if you're a Christian. And the other side, you can't tell me what to do. Huge argument. So much so, Paul writes in. And Paul writes in, the first thing he says is this, guys, why are we talking more about meat than Jesus? If we're going to work on unity, we should be working on a unity around Jesus. You know why? <laughs> Paul's going, we're never going to be unified on meat. But he's going to hold two perspectives. He wants both sides to see. And so he says to his Jewish friends, guys, I totally get it why you don't want to eat that meat. I know how you grew up. I know that the law is a big deal for you. And I know you feel close to God when you obey the law. So if you don't want to eat the meat, then don't do it. Paul goes, I don't think you should do it. But what you can't do is take your perspective and hold against your brothers over here who don't grow, come from the background you come from. They don't come, you know, they're not Jewish. They're Gentiles. And they're coming in and they don't understand your ways. And oh, by the way, guys, if you invite your Jewish brothers over to your house to have dinner, just don't cook the idol meat. Serve your brother and sister because you guys are on the same team. Do you see how it's possible that in the same conversation, both parties can be right? When you are able to see the perspective of the other side, it begins to give you clarity and understanding. And again, what I've learned is our experiences, they play a huge role in what we believe. All of us grew up in different ways. All of us have had different people who have influenced us. And I'm just convinced that you will never argue somebody over to your side, ever. You will never argue someone over to your side. I see your posts on Facebook and you've got your side and there's a line and you're throwing darts to, you know, to the other side. Not once in the comment section have I seen someone go, you know what, you're right, I'm gonna come to your side, ever. I've never seen someone through an argument of I'm right, you're wrong, Someone on the other side going, I think you're right. Never. I've never seen it work out like that. Peacemakers know that it's almost impossible to argue your way to a solution. It's almost impossible to argue your way that I'm right, and, and then there's going to be people that are going to run over to your side and go, you're right. You're right. When you told me I was wrong, you were right. It very rarely happens. The key to making peace, I think, is understanding and the key to understanding is perspective. And when you have perspective, it's easier to love. When you have perspective, it's not so much more you know, about the topic. It's about the person. And understanding how a person gets to a place where their perspective is different than yours. I mean, Jesus says it. He's really clear. With people that don't share your beliefs, and pick a topic. Abortion, sexual orientation, political affiliation. He didn't say you have to agree with them. Don't get confused. He didn't say you have to agree with them. He said you have to love them. And there are too many groups of people. Church, there are too many groups of people on the other side of our belief systems where we have drawn lines who don't believe what we believe. But we have interacted with them in a way that it's not been loving. See, in our culture, we've believed this lie. That if you love somebody, you affirm what they believe. You affirm what they do. I think it's one of the biggest lies in the context of our culture today, and it's not true. You can love somebody and not agree with what they do. You can love somebody and not come to the same belief that they have. See, we have believed that if that if there's a line drawn, there's somebody on the other side, then we should be creating space between us and them. Because we have it right, and they have it wrong. And now we're gonna argue that we're right, and you're wrong, and your life would be better if you come to this side. And yet, friends, nobody's crossing the line. Nobody from the other side is, is crossing the line. You can love somebody 
and not believe what they believe. You can love somebody and not agree with their belief system. Which means that if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian and if you're gonna be a peacemaker, you don't draw lines, you cross them. You start ending up in conversations and having dinners and coffees with people that other Christians who do draw lines go, you can't do that. Who did you hang out with? Who did you have dinner with? I mean, this is what Jesus did. You know, one of the reasons why Jesus was crucified, because he's hanging out with people that religious people said you can't hang out with. He's having dinner with tax collectors. He's got prostitutes washing his feet. He's hanging out with Samaritans at a well. You want to talk about two groups of people that hated each other, Jews and Samaritans, and Jesus goes, no, not me, I'm going to cross that line. And he got the attention of the culture of the day because who he was hanging out with. He wasn't creating distance with people that were different than him, he was closing the gap. And the reason why it caused tension is because people thought that Jesus was affirming what they were doing and he wasn't, he was loving them by being close and getting to know their story. People wanna know, especially people on the other side of your belief system, on the other side of your line, they wanna know that you're willing to hear their story. That you love them enough to try to understand and see the perspective that they have. It's not I'm right and you're wrong. It's hey, I would love to hear your story. Hey, I know we don't see this you know, in, in the same way, but. I would just love for you to tell me your story about how you got to the place of, of your belief. And they share. And you begin learning things about how they grew up. You learn things about their parents. You learn things about some of the, the big tragedies that have happened in their life. And I'm just telling you when, you, when you respond in that moment with, thank you. Man, thanks for sharing. I, I didn't realize that was part of your story and I can see how that has influenced your perspective. Do you just see how that's totally different than I'm right and you're wrong? This approach says, I love you. I love you. And I would love to hear, I would love to hear how your perspective is different than mine. I'd even love to hear the story that's influenced you of why you believe what you believe. The beautiful thing about Jesus is that he just didn't talk about how he loves you. He also demonstrated his love for you. In the context of lines, Jesus crossed the line first. Don't forget that. The relationship between God the creator and his creation, we're the ones that messed that up. And then Jesus will be the one that crosses the line. He comes to us. He walks on this planet. His foundational message is that he loves you. And then he shows you how much he loves you by going to hang on a cross. And that guy, here's what he says, John 14, 27. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. See, it's different. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Here's the interesting thing. In most of the world, when we use the word peace, it really just means the absence of war. But in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is this word shalom. It's not just the absence of conflict. Shalom is also the presence of something better in its place. It just doesn't remove war and then leave a void. It removes war. And it introduces something far better. See, here's what I think. If you're gonna be a peacemaker, and if you're gonna live a life of shalom, approach matters. And I'm not budging on truth, and I'm not dumbing down the gospel. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe that Jesus loves me. I believe that he loves me so much that he was willing down to, to come down to this earth and he died on a cross for my sins. And Jesus said that anyone who believes in him would experience everlasting life. And as a young boy, I came to a conclusion that I needed that. And so I stepped in and became a follower of this guy named Jesus, who 
who 2,000 years ago, people would say this, this, this movement is called the way. It's different, it stands out. And see, here's the approach, church. In the context of the culture in which we live, I hold all those truths to be true. I believe the only way to salvation is through Jesus. I'll never budge. I believe that when whatever Jesus says causes tension with what our culture says, I choose Jesus every time. I believe in his truth. I believe in who he is. You know what I also believe? Is that Jesus spent his whole life removing conflict in the hearts and minds of people and introducing himself. And he did it much differently than a lot of times how we do it. Oh, I'm gonna tell him truth, I'm gonna tell him truth, I'm gonna tell him truth, great. But approach matters. When people get into the scriptures, they go to John 3 and they go, well, he went to Nicodemus in John 3 and he told Nicodemus the truth. And I go, yeah, Nicodemus called the meeting. Well, well, what about in John 4 with the woman at the well? Jesus had a conversation with her. And I go, yeah, he was able to have the conversation because he already knew her story. He's Jesus, he knows all things. He knew everything about her, which amazed her. And then he called her to something better. He removed something and then he introduced himself. People go, well, what about John 8? The woman caught in adultery and Jesus says, go and sin no more. That's truth. And I go, yeah, you know what he did before that? He saved her from getting stoned. He just didn't roll in and go, guys, I'm right. You're wrong. You know what he did? He had meals with people. He sat down with the outcast, the unclean, the unrighteous. He got crucified for it. Thousands of people started following him because when the world said, we don't want anything to do with you, you're on the other side. Jesus crossed the line. And he said, I know they call you tax collectors. I know they call you sinners. I know they say you're the unrighteous, but if you follow me, I'll remove that. And I'll give you something far greater. On earth, you'll be the last. In my kingdom, you'll be first. Being a peacemaker is the core of our faith. And here's the thing, I want as many people I want as many people, because I think this is what Jesus wants, I want as many people to discover what I discovered. That Jesus is who he says he is. And I'm just willing, and I don't know about you, but I'm just willing to have a different approach. Not because I'm changing my beliefs, but because I love people. And I think we should be a generation that is okay sitting down with people who are far different than us. In fact, if you don't have a meal on the calendar this month, with somebody who's on the other side of your belief system, Jesus might say, well then you're not really a peacemaker. It's easy to love people who love you. It's easy to be around people who are just like you. But Christians, Jesus says they're different. You know what Christians do? <laughs> they go to places and they hang out with people and the world watches and can't make sense of it. And Jesus says, here's why. In my kingdom, blessed are the peacemakers. If you're gonna be in my family, if you wanna know what it looks like to be a child of God, Jesus goes, look for the people that are bringing peace. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray this morning that you'd help us in a polarizing culture filled with hot topics. Lines have been drawn. That we would be a, a church courageous enough and bold enough in our beliefs that we would go where you go. That we would cross the line. We'd almost be energized to, to have a conversation with somebody who's different than us. That we would lead with love. We wouldn't be so consumed with being right that we might get to know people and serve people and love people that instead of creating circles and keeping people out, well, we would be a church that says, man, you are always 
welcome to be in my house. You're always welcome to be a part of our church. You're always welcome to sit at my table. And I can't wait for the day that you would invite me to be part of yours. That we would be a church that would be smart enough to know there are people who see it differently than us. And if we truly care about people and love people like you did, that we would be willing to change our approach. To close the gap. And to love people who don't love us. And to love on people who don't think like us. And to serve people, to be generous with people <laughs> that we might even call our enemies. Because in your kingdom, those are the children of God. Father, we thank you for Jesus and the life he lived. He's shown us, he's shown us the way. I pray that this week we might live a little bit more like him. We pray all this in his name. Amen. 30 seconds, 30 seconds real quick before you go. Two weeks from today, July 24th, both campuses are going to be hanging out at Anderson Farm. So if you show up to one of our campuses, you're doing church all by yourself, all right? So July 24th, if you were here last year, we did this. It was amazing, so much fun. We're going to have service out there at 10 o'clock. I want to encourage you to get there early. Uh, that way you get a great parking spot. we got a coffee truck that's going to be out there. You can get some coffee. 10 o'clock, we get started. We're going to have about a 45-minute service, and then we're going to have a whole lot of fun out there at Anderson Farms, have lunch and all the activities that come with it. It is free for you. You just show up, and let's spend some time together. Bring a lawn chair, a blanket, maybe even a tent if you were hot last year, and that's going to be an excellent time. So we'll see you then. Have a good rest of the day, and have a great week. Bye-bye.